and hello people um, that have joined us today from all over the world, um, which is so incredible um, to be here in community together. Um, and to Bethan, Helen, Nicole, thank you so much um, for, I guess, reenacting um, in some way a session that you've already generously provided as part of our summit um, to do again from popular demand. Um, so grateful to have you here. Um, before we started, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the land that I'm on. Um, so I'm calling from um, Wathorong country, part of the Kulin Nation in Victoria. And I wanted to honour uh, the land of which we're all calling from across Australia and acknowledge that the traditional owners and Aboriginal people that own the land and also widen that in this circle that's become this online community across the world and acknowledge um, traditional and Indigenous people, knowledge and systems. Um, so let's move into talking about play. Um, and I'll just introduce for you at home, um, the people on the screen. Uh, so we have Bethan. Um, hi, Bethan. Hello. <laughs> Bethan is um, originally from the UK and has spent 10 years, curiously, and for those of you who haven't met Bethan in person before, Curious is a beautiful quality of hers, um, exploring all different kinds of early learning environments around Asia, New Zealand and Australia. For the past five years, she has been listening, learning and living in remote and regional central, central Australia in a variety of ECEC settings as early year educator advocating for educational reform and as a coordinator for remote supported play groups. So thank you, Bethan. Thank you. Um, Helen's work is based in Alice Springs. Um, Helen travels to remote communities, supporting family and community led culturally relevant learning environments for Aboriginal families. Thank you, Helen. Um, and Nicole, Nicole Key works with Playgroups Australia as the national program manager for Play Connect, supporting playgroup uh, program for young children and families with autism spectrum disorder, developmental delays and behavioural concerns. Nicole is a social and cultural anthropologist with over a decade's experience working in the health and disability sector. Nicole lives in Canberra, getting frost off her car um, with her two delightful children, um, one of which is on the autism spectrum. So thank you so much. And I'm just going to vanish into the background now and hand it over to you. And I might pop back in um, at around quarter two. Um, and just for people that are listening, please feel free to pop questions as we go along in the chat um, so that we can have as, in, as much engagement as possible. So thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. um, and hello to all you amazing caregivers, um, OTs I've seen flashing up, educators, families, all around um, lover of many humans. Um, and yeah, thank you for accepting this invitation to play with us today. Um, yeah, over the next 60 minutes, we hope to just explore, uh, inspire, and just invite some of that uh, curiosity into today's um, exploration. Um, and yeah, we'd also just like to pause and take a breath for the Aranda uh, land that we're on in, uh, in Bontawa, otherwise known as Alice Springs and uh, acknowledging yeah all of the um spirits that reside on our land still and um the people that we work with and whose knowledge and wisdom really consciously and unconsciously shaped our thinking in so many ways um and we've invited you to play with us today um knowing all the research that there is out there around play for um early years children and how that's forming our Forming their brains um, and their learning um, and you know play forms that understanding of the world around you as a child and play is also uh, unhurried uh, inclusive grounding um, full of choice so so many different elements to play and I think as you know educators or as grown-ups um, we can often forget to allow that space for us to play. Yeah. Um, we can often, um, you know, let the time of life take over us and that busyness and creating that space is so important. Um, 
Uh, there's a quote um, from John Cleves that says, if you uh, want creative workers, give them enough time to play. So <laughs> I think for early years educators it's, and uh, parents, families, just all around humans, it's important for us to create that space to be playful um, that's so innately within children. Um, so, yeah, um, we'll just go to you, Helen, yeah, just to... Yeah. Well, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit, a bit about the effect that the virus has had on us, I suppose. And just as Bethan's thinking, talking, it reminded me of a, a beautiful um, photo that my sister who lives in Melbourne, one of the, just the suburb of Melbourne, sent to me. She knows how um, passionate I am about seeing children out in the nature and playing. And... Very interestingly, because all of the playground equipment's been, um, you know, virtually out of out of bounds and quarantined, kids have actually had to find somewhere else to play. And she was just walking in her, her park where there was a bit of bush and she sent me a photo of two beautiful, what we out here call humpies or elters, which are the, the um, Aboriginal kids and families would be making as shelters. Um, our kids in suburban Melbourne are making the most amazing cubby houses out of bark, sticks, leaves. And I just thought, wow, that's actually one of the real positives of, of the playground equipment and being put out of quarantine, out of into quarantine, because <laughs> kids are out there playing and experiencing their world in a different way. So last time we did this um, session, which would have been, what, six weeks, four, to four weeks to six weeks ago, we were in the early stages of quarantine and, and we were, you know, really reflecting on some of the difficulties that people were going through. Um, I know I've heard of a few people saying we don't really want it to end. We actually don't want the, the old normal back again. We actually have really enjoyed the time and the, and the quiet um, for people to take time out of their lives and actually have time to stop and think. And I've been really excited to hear stories of families that, that have Said, you know, it's just been a real joy to be at home with their kids and and just not going out and rushing off to footy practice or, um, you know, ballet lessons. And kids are actually really enjoying the downtime as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's put us into a position of seeing life in a different way. And we need that from time to time. We need to actually take some time out and stop to stop and smell the roses and actually see that that. Um, the world that we've, we are creating is not necessarily been, a, been the best one. So mm -hmm. that's just my feeling. Um, and it also gives us a start to thinking in a more inclusive way, perhaps, about how it is to be in isolation, maybe being the prisoner that's been in, you know, in jail for 30 years, how that must feel if you've been in isolation for two weeks or um, if you were on the, the cruise ship and no one would let you into your into their country because you, you know, you were seen to be um, full of the virus. So people have been forced in a way to, to see another perspective and I think that um, has been a good thing in many ways, as well as some of the neg more negative things about people's lives and their mortality, which are really concerning. So back to you, Bethan, I think. Yeah, so um, opening up that curiosity hmm. with something a bit tangible. So um, there was an invitation to um, bring um, something from nature, perhaps some rocks or stones, um, leaves. Um, perhaps if um, you didn't get a chance to do that or they weren't available to you, even something close by that perhaps is catching your attention right now. Um, if it's a, a natural material, great, but that, you know, if not, no worries. Just something for you to invite that curiosity with and mm. to connect with. Mm. Um, so I've got a um, Kwandong and an Inti Seed necklace, which I, you know, I love to, <laughs> <laughs> to ground, to ground and to, um, to touch throughout the day. So yeah, I'll use, I'll use this. Um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to take anything, Nicole, or something to... Absolutely. Add. I have a handful of gorgeous autumn leaves from my garden. Oh, oh <laughs> I miss those colours. <laughs> and what have you got? I've got, my, I've got my little ninty seeds too, which are beautiful autumnal colours. And I've got some really nice little gum nuts that just make me feel nice running them through my fingers. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. We'll just take a moment here to um, invite a breath in through the nose and out through the nose. 
this world of word of grounding, which is quite popular now these days with just bringing us back to the present moment, essentially, and natural materials can be a great way to help you do that, to connect. I'm just going to gently explore. So it was originally um, Rudolf, Rudolf Steiner who um, proposed that there are 12 senses. So quite often we can explore through our five senses. But I'll just tell a little story as you're perhaps um, exploring the texture, perhaps the gentle touch of your object that you're exploring. And this theory that, you know, it has later been expanded by many other theorists, but it was um, proposed that senses are so um, important to develop um, because it really starts to reveal that um, aspect of sensory reality. So it's forming your beliefs with um, your basis of your relationship with yourself and with those things around you. Um, and also the relationship between, um, you know, sensory perception and health and vitality. So, you know, as you're, as I was saying, those natural materials help to ground in the body as well. That can be something, well, that is something that as an educator, I really consider the kind of materials that I use and that relationship that children will form with those relationships with um, the materials. Um, so the 12 senses, like start with your body, so the sense of touch, perhaps noticing the touch of your natural material. Also, there's life as a sense from Steiner, movement and balance. So perhaps moving the object around, exploring the different balance. And then you move to the external world, so it's broken down into three sections. So that's your smell, perhaps you can bring the, the object to the nose taste which can <laughs> I know lots of children like to sometimes try and taste these beads so that's always a consideration with the materials isn't it what mm. age range are we working with you know can children pop things into their mouth and those senses are formed through sight as well mm. so you can feel something but that sight can also give you that um, idea and, and then you go to the, the spiritual the immaterial world Senses as well, um, with this approach, it's your hearing, speech, thought, and ego. Mm. So yeah, mm. it's it's interesting that with the senses, mm. and you know, just keeping them in your your hand mm. and exploring mm. if you can, just um, how they are split into um, like the lowest, the physical sense to start with, the middle four senses of feeling, and then you know, coming down to the more immaterial um, mm. parts of the senses. Mm. So I just wanted to give a tangible exploration of that, just for you to maybe not bring words to, um, but just as a, as a thought, as a bit of a segue into today. Mm. I don't know how you um, explored or found that, Nicole, or if you're familiar with that kind of those 12 senses, um, but how did you find that? Um, I always love touching those natural materials. They do bring that beautiful grounding that you speak about. Um, I guess for me, I was thinking about the gorgeous colours and the textures of the leaves. Um, and reflecting back, I guess, to, to inclusive practice and working with children across, I guess, a whole range of needs and um, abilities, it makes me think about how we're all different. We all change at different rates. We all grow at different rates. Um, and I love seeing that reflected in nature. How about you, Helen? Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking. I was thinking about the young child. You know, a very, a very young child, developing child, and they're reaching out. You know, natural materials are such a, a catch for kids, and they part of their need to explore is to grab and use those first senses to begin with, the, the sight to look at them, to reach out and feel how they are in their hands, um, often to taste. You know, and so off. So often when objects are small, a watchful adult needs to be close by when kids are, are looking to explore materials. But I was also thinking about that importance of the environment that's around that child when they're in a natural world. You know, how does the environment feel? And I think that's probably a little bit of what you're talking about with Steiner's 
other seven senses actually, mm -hmm. because this is new to me too, to hear about the, the, the other seven senses. And so often we just think about, you know, the here and now, but the environment and how it affects children is, is a really powerful sense. And children are, are you know, are really tuned into that as well. So I was thinking how it is for kids in so many ways and in the environments we create for kids too, because often our environments are very artificial mm -hmm. and they actually need to be constructed. And there's more to it than just a purely physical, you know, presence to the environment that we construct for children. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think mm. when we um, are reminded of the, you know, or invited to explore mm. the different mm. senses that are out there and how that they, you know, can form a child's reality, but also mm. forming their physical body mm. as well. Mm. And that kind of, um, you know, balance as an educator mm. or a parent of mm. um, interaction and interference with that process as well. So mm. like the, the learning is in that exploration and mm. as an educator, we can sometimes interfere. So it's a, it's a dance as an mm. educator, isn't it? Mm. To uh, move between um, scaffolding and also exploration mm. of learning. Yeah. We've got, there's, a, there's a very, um, a new, well, it was a new to me I, I, and I can't say who I can acknowledge said this at a workshop that I went to, but they, they said there's a very fine line before between interference and interaction as well. Because if we're always ready to save that child from the, from the thing that they're about to explore, then we're actually interfering with their learning mm -hmm. and their ability to find out for themselves or to discover for themselves the properties of something. Yeah. So we have to be really mindful about how we do interact and how we interfere and is it interaction or is it interference yeah mm. yeah the mm. joy of play and exploration yeah. um mm. so yeah i mean i think I, I touched upon um you know this kind of i have some natural materials on my desk or I, you know i actually like to wear natural jewelry as well to you know connect to um and again, touching on that kind of thought in terms of the materials we use. So um, as an early years um, educator, I'm, um, you know, um, a nature-based educator. I'm really lucky to be outside with um, play. Um, often we're, we're not in a building, so we aren't confined to those, those things, which I know is, you know, the same for everyone. Um, and I was just wondering with you, Nicole, um, I know so, um, so many of the children um, you, you work with, um, you must do a lot of sensory exploration and, um, you know, really senses must form so much of your thought in um, your programming, planning and your world. So I'd love to, yeah, hear your thoughts and sharing on that. Thanks, Beth. And it's interesting looking at, I guess, the people who have joined us today coming from a really diverse range of therapists, um, people working in early intervention and educators. Um, for those of you who work with children with disability regularly, the, the concept of, of sensory play is not an uncommon one, I'm sure. Um, so we have, I think, just over 40 play groups for children with um, autism spectrum disorder around the country. And we find the vast majority of children have some sort of sensory um, issues, whether they're sensory seekers uh, or sensory aversions. Um, now, the sensory requirements of those children and the way we as their educators in play manage them has a huge impact on their behaviour and their interactions, not, I guess, just within that play setting, but more broadly. Um, so the sensory seeking behaviours, you're all familiar with them, I'm sure. There's the kids who cannot stop moving. Now, that might be their whole body. Um, or it might be the foot bounce or the arm bounce that's continuous for hours on end. Um, the risk taking or self harming behaviours or, or overly rough or noisy play. Um, and now those kids are really underreactive. So we work really hard to build additional stimulation into their play experiences. So that might be um, giving them a in COVID, obviously, this is not best practice, but giving them a tub of coloured rice that they can sit in and feel the texture and grains of the rice around their body. Um, or a whole range of textures that they can explore with their hands to really ground that, um, that need for touch. For the children that are sensory have sensory aversions, most often we find this is to noise or touch. And again, um, I'm preaching to the converted. Those of you working with kids in this sphere certainly are aware of these aversions. Um, we find it's loud noises, particular tones or pitches. Uh, for some kids, it's about physical contact or a certain texture. 
And the way we can support these sensory needs really impacts on the way they, they can be actively included. So if we're providing supports for these children, um, whether that's embedding them or supporting their need to be away from sensory input, we can make sure they have a much more uh, meaningful engagement in a mainstream setting. Mm, that's, um, you know, as an educator that does consider these things, that's like really rich and for me to hear and to explore as an educator. So I, yeah, I love that. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot lately about, um, you know, what constitutes so a, a rich learning environment. So quite often you can have, um, you know, just different develop children at different developmental levels. So, you know, in a play group setting um, here for me in Alice Springs, it's zero to five year old. So it's, you know, there's, there's being inclusive with age ranges as well. And to, to look at those environments and yeah, like you were saying that kind of non um, tangible environment as well mm. being really important as well so mm. nature's great for that because it can pr provide that natural environment but yeah really considering the the environment itself um, mm. Mm. and and I think you know our, our situation here in Alice Springs is, is fairly unique I suppose um, and Beth and I have both worked mainly in Aboriginal um, programs in Alice and we have a lot of kids that that whose main learning style is very tactile, is very, um, you know, they, their whole learn, their, their classroom is the out, outdoor environment. So some of these kids come to our, stay at our play groups, actually. They, they go to school, but school has not really engaged them. And unfortunately, the school, in many cases, the school is just not ready for the kids who are coming in with have a very different learning style and a very different way of coping with that very um, closed environment of four walls. So we, you know, I think a lot about the kids that are sometimes roaming the streets because school has not, is not meeting their needs. Um, and that's why our play groups actually <laughs> um, are, even though we're not, you know, we aren't supposed to be, be taking children here who are over school age, on occasions when they've been expelled from school, um, they come and they and their play is just absolutely beautiful, and they can be so engaged at so many different levels. And the and the the way they can actually scaffold, um, you know, the younger children. We have beautiful, um, you know, mixed age groups of play. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You see mm -hmm. ad adaptive learning mm -hmm. that seems to be a struggle in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. outside of the classroom and mm -hmm. those constraints the you know behavior the the concentration mm -hmm. is uh so different and the learning is so rich mm -hmm. um we yeah. have an opportunity to actually see those kids at their absolute best and such skilled incredible creative kids but the classroom sees them as a problem so you know that's that's a, re a sad reality but we also have the, the benefit of seeing them at, at their best don't we yeah mm. There's a couple of really interesting points there, Helen, I'd love to pick up around, I guess, inclusive practice for children with disability, which is the space I, I feel most comfortable. Um, yes. We absolutely echo those sentiments of, of families needing to feel welcome and engaged in a learning space. So particularly when many of the families we're working with, whether it's a family with disability or an Aboriginal family or another culturally marginal group, um, we're often talking about multiple layers of family trauma. We're talking about social disadvantage, social isolation, um, poverty, violence. Um, and for these families, the layers combine to make the whole family feel unwelcome, isolated, unworthy. And trying to get that family engagement, trying to work past those barriers is really central to capturing the kids often, I think, um, mm -hmm. whether that's in an education or a therapy setting. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. In yeah. our, um, you know, we're working in an intergenerational models where families are key to um, child's learning. And also it's that, um, you know, appreciation that families are the child's best teachers and they know their child and they are the expert of the child, their child's learning. And to be able to open that inclusive space is um, where you know that safety and that learning can really thrive. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, why don't I just jump in there for a minute? Yeah. 
Um, one of the things that we've actually really hit on is it might not be rocket science, it's actually, you know, traditional practice. But when the when the adults are engaged in doing something really meaningful and, and that, that is of huge interest to them, so it might be the women might be weaving or painting or um, they could be making beautiful beads. <laughs> but when they're really fully engaged, the kids actually don't need the adults. They they are happy to to explore and play around the adults, but the adults are, are grounding the space. Mm -hmm. And that's and we've come to a point in some of, in our work now where we actually say we need to plan for the adults first because particularly when we're working with families who have experiencing trauma they might come in and their minds you know are not focused they're in the flight and fight mode but if we can settle them and and have them doing something that's therapeutically really valuable for them then the kids just immediately settle and and their play is so beautiful so it, it's it's almost like we plan for the adults and then and then we plan for the kids. Yeah, working in that spiral that everything connects, mm, everything, everything and everyone connected. is connected. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and I think one of the really beautiful and unexpected benefits of, of mm. that mm. is that you end up with a family capacity building model rather than just working on strengthening and teaching the child. Yeah. You're building the skills and the security of the whole family, which mm. greatly increases the therapeutic and educational outcomes for all of them. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. We know that, you know, a play group can form, you know, 5% of your week and the yes. rest is, you know, you're at home. So to, mm. you know, to strengthen that for, mm. you know, families and children mm. is it's mm. integral, isn't it? Mm. And, so, and one of the things that we've also found and we've talked about a lot is that many of the, the adults that we're working with haven't you know, those that have come from their own traumatic sort of stories haven't actually played in that deep and meaningful way themselves. So some of the, the activities or the, the materials or the craft that the women are working on is actually their own, it's play, you know, they're, mm. they're playing themselves. And so they're, they're healing themselves at the same time as, as being very present for their kids. So it's a, it is a beautiful, it's a beautiful circle that goes on. Yeah, mm. we, it's mm. like that that, mm. that space that we have to mm. that time we need to pencil in for our play as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've got you know I know last time we talked um, you know you explored I think you were at a workshop back in Melbourne. Mm. Um, did you want to touch on that? If, we, if we've got time. Talk about it. <laughs> I just thought it was yeah, yeah we've still got time. I thought it was um, it it was great because it just formed some. I mean, I mean, we've done a bit of an exploration and I guess this was kind of some um, some points, some yeah. guidance, yeah. some pointers well, yeah, to share. Sort of almost pulling it together. Mm. Um, and this is going back a long time because I have worked in early childhood to see a whole, um, so many changes. Um, but anyway, this was back in the, the mid 90s and I was working in long daycare at the time. And we, we had a lot of centres that were opening up that were all private and they started to become very sterile environments. They were concerned about um, um, being sued for, for accidents and whatever. So they started screwing their furniture down. They were taking grass up. They were putting down, you know, fake turf. Um, the environments became really quite sterile. And, but at the same time, what we started to see, and we, we were seeing children coming in for long periods of time into these, environments 10 hours a day in, in very sterile environments and and we were seeing more and more behavior problems and I was working in um, in an inclusion program at that time or it had just begun to and there was a, a, a woman who worked with um, multicultural resource center in Melbourne she did a workshop called the challenging child and she'd, she'd been investigating what it was about these environments that we were creating in early childhood versus what actually constituted a really positive learning environment for anybody, actually. Um, and she started asking us all, um, you know, where was it that we would go if we, well, where, where were the places that we felt stressed in? And people named, you know, sitting in a traffic jam, being on public transport, um, in a crowded train, um, possibly sitting in the dentist or being in the doctors, were mostly the places where they felt stressed. And, and then we were asked to reflect on where we'd best like to be. 
if we had a choice, where would we want to go? And so people, you know, somebody wanted to go to the beach and someone wanted to go up into the mountains. Someone wanted to sit, you know, in their bedroom and, and um, read a book. Um, someone else wanted to, to watch Netflix. Um, other people wanted to go and visit family. Mm -hmm. um, but what she concluded from this workshop, and she actually ended up um, writing a small book on it. Her name was Heather Lawrence. I'd like to acknowledge her thoughts because she was very, um, she, she really influenced my thinking. And I've continued to use her, her five categories that she calls um, the five distinct settings that support feelings of happiness and relaxation. I'm just reading them at the moment. But the first one that she mentioned was being in a home-like environment. So if you couldn't be at home, then you needed to be in an environment that made you feel at home. Whatever it was that home created, you'd be, you'd be looking to, to, um, for those elements. She identified being outside in nature is really important. Um, being, doing something really meaningful in the way of craft or interest. So it might even be something as simple as watching Netflix, but that was something that, that was meaningful to you. Um, being with loving and um, accepting family and friends and being able to spend time alone was really important um, for people too. So when I think about those five categories, Yes, and I wonder first if, if you can think of anything that relates, you know, perhaps to your either personal experience or your own experience working with kids mm. and how you might relate those five areas. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it really touches upon, you know, what we have, um, you know, already explored and uh, Nicole said too about that inclusive family environment. Mm. So, um, you know, how... Um, how is the home environment, you know, from a educator's point of view, using your reflective practice of what your home experience is to yourself is different for everybody. So really taking those things into um, consideration in your environment and really adapting that to, um, you know, support people's feelings of home and place in mm. home. Mm. Um, and yeah, that, and again, coming down to, to the materials of that so you know that's that's not your typical perhaps home play setting that's looking at different cubby settings yeah. even different um you know materials for sharing food um yeah so i guess that's that's where my mind comes to mm. for that it's that reflective practice as an educator and you know you you um you're thinking of, of the families you're working with Mm. Yeah, and and if we, I mean, in our case, we probably have the benefit of being able to do home visits, and we spend you know time visiting people at home, so we have the privilege mm. of seeing what homes like as well, and so we can reflect that in um, in the environments we set up for kids to play in. I've yeah. got to say, this is the area um, that keeps me feeling really um, passionate and a bit excited because we have yeah. real opportunity for influence. Um, yeah. So when we ask the families who attend our groups, what are the barriers to them attending mainstream anything, whether that's a therapy, whether that's a mainstream playgroup or education, what are the barriers to their engagement? Mm -hmm. um, for 10 years, the families have told us exactly the same thing. The main barriers is this lack of understanding and acceptance about their child and their child's behaviour. Um, feelings of judgment and being different um, which we all know is a horrible feeling, but when you've got a really obvious physical disability or behavioural disability, it's quite notable and that social isolation is really compounded. Um, con concerns about their child's behaviour, desperately worried their children are going to hurt someone. Um, the unsuitability of setting, that lack of home-like qualities, but for children who need a fence or need um, a space with no sharp edges or you know, those safety concerns to be addressed in a different way. Um, and then for our Indigenous families, they talk about the service being a white fella thing. So feeling that there's no recognition of culture or people and there's, it's, there's no place for them within that space. Um, and I guess for our learning environments to be welcoming and inclusive, we really need to challenge these barriers across the board. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. absolutely. There's such good examples, Nicole. <laughs> yeah. Um, 10 years of repetition, we're trying to get the message across. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is that thing. It's, um, you know, it can be written within the right thing, within policies or, you know, oh, we've discovered this kind of revolutionary, that's not revolutionary thing to do of listening to families mm -hmm. and um, really um, like adapting 
to that, but I think to, um, you know, as educators to, you know, that like deeply reflect on that, you know, and that therefore then allows that, that the wisdom of the parents, uh, you know, creating those spaces uh, for the wisdom of the parents to come through so that you can work together and support those environments. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just I'm, checking that. I'm, yeah, sorry, I'll just yeah, check the time. Yeah. Ten past that we've yeah, got. Yeah, we've got time. Yeah, we've, we've got time. <laughs> it, I, I was just going to sum up with what um, Heather Lawrence said. It was just the point that environments have incredible power over the people that are working working and playing and, and existing in those environments. And the power of that environment to influence our feelings and our behaviour um, can't really be underestimated. So it's a very powerful thing, that environment and what we create and just how we are as educators in that environment mm -hmm. is so important to be to be checking every day. And out here we have we have something that we call the willy willy that you'll see out in the hot weather and, and in amongst the sand. If you're travelling out out bush and you're travelling through the sand, you'll see the willy willies just you know flying up into the air. And I often look at that willy willy and I think I don't want to be that willy willy that comes in and just whips up a storm in an environment. You know how am I? I think about how I am in in the environment and am I settled? Am I present? Am I ready? For the people that are walking into my environment, am I making sure that I'm not one of the the um, causes of the stress for the families that are coming in each day? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. Um, I'm seeing some really great comments coming up, um, and yeah, honouring that this is like a real, you know, yeah, there's some amazing. Um, people from all over the world actually I can see someone from Singapore here and uh, too and just um, you know as an early years educator um, really um, cherish, cherishing this like as a learning opportunity because we um, like there's so many different um, backgrounds and also um, qualifications um, that work with children and of sometimes we can be uh, working in silos or um, although we shouldn't be but this could be a great opportunity while we have so many different professions and as Anna was calling it different people with different hats mm. to share mm. perhaps um, while we have this extra time we didn't have it last time mm. um, so I'm not sure um, yeah what you think Anna for, for doing that um, I'm just gonna just mm. try and field some questions here mm. Um, just firstly, um, whilst I've just asked people to share their reflections and ask any questions, um, okay. Nicole, do you mind, there was a few people that requested just um, saying those five things again that you, that you were talking about earlier, the five points? The five points were Helen's, but mine were around the barriers to inclusion in mainstream practice. Yep. Um, Yes, so for us, I'm reading mine to make sure I get them right. Uh, lack of understanding and acceptance about their child and their child's behaviour. So relating specifically to ASD in our case, uh, families feel like their early childhood services or their mainstream providers don't know enough about autism to be able to understand their child. Um, feelings of judgement and notable difference. Um, worried that other people are going to see them as a bad parent um, because they're managing behaviour that is atypical, their parenting is going to look different and feelings of judgment about that. Um, concerns about their behaviour of their child, really worried they're going to hurt someone. So this is particularly those sensory seekers, worried they're going to play too roughly, they're going to bite someone, they're going to hit someone. Um, unsuitability of the setting for their children. So this is around safety. Um, lots of kids with ASD are runners. If you don't have a fenced space, the ability of the parent to relax um, is nil. Um, but you know, there's, there's other considerations around the types of toys that are safe for the child to have around them, whether or not they're going to try to drink the glue or lick the blackboard. Um, but just having a mindful a mindfulness, I guess, of the opportunities for risk in that environment. Um, and then for our Indigenous families, it's about recognising culture and creating a space for them within your setting. Um, and I guess trying to, to just really focus on that concept of inclusion and try to find space and exploring what inclusion actually means for the family um, about giving those children the opportunity to have access to exactly the same things even if it's in a slightly different way uh, to other children. Ooh. Thank you. Um, 
And just to point you ladies to the chat, there's a couple of amazing questions coming through. So I might yeah, vanish, we vanish are, again. We are seeing yeah. them. They're, they're, what, they're very good. I love yeah. the, um, I think it's Michaela. Um, she's asking if there's any strategies or comments, evidence around play in early years of um, school, particularly mm. in prep and year one. Mm. Um, we know that teachers can find it so hard to include play in their timetabling as curriculum can be so demanding. Mm. What can you tell them to encourage prioritizing this time? Mm. Um, yeah, this is a real passion <laughs> of mine. If <laughs> you want to go into, worms, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, going into, uh, I guess, you know, year one, what mm. age is that for mm. a child? But um, you know, mm. if you look at models mm. in, you know, Finland do this really, really great where, you know, children aren't expected to read or write until seven because mm. play is um, so privileged as um, such a high form of learning, mm. you know, that forms literacy and numeracy um, and that is forming all of those neural pathways. And it's so rich that, mm. you know, building those through play will then follow that later on. So mm. there's kind of this not not rush and that play is so privileged. Mm. Um, and I guess really framing it in, you know, that create, framing your creativity through that, you know, academic framework, which could be through literacy and numeracy. So, you know, you can create really rich um, literacy filled play environments, um, whether that be through, um, you know, um, allowing that language to form and you um, noticing that and supporting that with um, with the environments that you're setting up and also that, you know, including numeracy within that too. Um, but there's totally lots of, um, you know, research out there as well um, from those kind of like overseas models and we're kind of getting a little bit um, better at that. You know, Steiner, I guess, out here would be a closer... Um, to more of that play mm. for older children as well. And, and knowing that it doesn't just stop it in the early years, like, oh, you've yes. got till three to do it. Yes, that's it. Um, yeah. And the cognitive, you know, um, um, who's our favorite um, theorist, the old Piaget? <laughs> it was Piaget that that told us about the, the sensory motor stage of the child from virtually up to three, where everything is the senses that are forming, you know, forming their um, information about the world around them. And up until seven, the child really isn't thinking cognitively. They're still taking information in through their senses. So really seven is that kind of magic age when they're starting to do more formal thinking. Up until then, we're actually feeding the brain through the senses. And if we try to hurry that process and we think we have to, you know, fill the brain up too early, we're actually seeing that you know, the deficits of that in later years when, when children are burning out or, and, and young teenagers who, you know, who are just not coping with the expectations of the world. But also the information about the world around you has to be gleaned from your environment first before you can actually understand it in your mind. So that there's no, it's no accident that, that children need to be sensory learners before they, before they are cognitive learners. And we need to be looking at their developmental abilities and and work slowly on that, not not have a hurried approach. As as someone um, just beautifully mentioned about the you know the idea of the unhurried child, we really have to, you know, I really truly believe that if we want to build a solid foundation for life, we have to respect and honour those first seven years. Absolutely. Um, I don't know whether that quite answers the the problem for the teacher in the classroom, but. But you need to think about what materials you've got in there. You know, if everything is is really, you know, trying to fill that head up, you know, the, and the problem is in the behaviour of the children. If you've got children that are really reacting to that that environment, then you need to think, well, what is it that they need that is going to settle them and calm them and ground them? Mm. I'm going to add my, my, two cents, my two cents in there as well. Um, I guess drawing on it. So not from an education perspective, the kids we work with are a lot younger than that, um, but drawing on my embeddedness with therapists, both professionally and personally, mm. uh, we find it wonderful the way the therapists we work with across disciplines embed that learning in play activities. So whether that's teaching a fine motor skill or teaching an academic outcome, uh, being able to use that curriculum and translate it into a play activity um, so that they're still learning, they're still achieving yeah. those box ticking exercises, but the yeah. kids think it's fun and they think it's free and unstructured and playful. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Totally. There are so many ways to, to learn something and it doesn't have to just be sitting at a desk in a, you know, <laughs> with a pen and paper. Yeah. Have you seen any questions on there, Nicole, that you would like to answer directly? I think we've managed to cover most of them as we've gone along. Um, I guess there were some questions earlier about how we do this, what this looks like. So it's all very well and good in sentiment to, to know that we need to embed play in our activities, but what this looks like. Um, I guess from my perspective, looking again at children with disability, we think about adaptive opportunities for learning. So if we have children across a range of, of learning spectrums, whether that's a typical, atypical and anywhere in between, it's trying to find activities that can be adapted or engaged with at different levels of development. Um, that's giving children with additional needs the opportunity to do the same or a similar thing as their mainstream counterparts and not excluding them. It's giving them the opportunity to join in, but having that breadth of experience across the activity um, and to focus on providing sensory support. So there was a question from a lady around a hyperactive child and what strategies yeah. to employ. Mm -hmm. um, with children with sensory needs, it absolutely depends on their particular sensory profile. And if there's any therapists involved in their care, I would be hooking them into the classroom for some, some, some support. Um, but most OTs I know would advocate for extensive movement breaks. Young children should not be sitting down for 45 minutes at a time, um, jumping up and down, getting input through their feet, input through their hands, input through their tailbone. Just that, that constant reinforcement of movement is likely to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Nicole. Yeah. <laughs> This no, is absolutely. a community, right? You've got people <laughs> past engaging in your community. <laughs> we were trying to. <laughs> no, but absolutely. And I yeah. think someone's, um, Myra's popped on there and when therapists and educators work together, it will bring amazing outcomes for all children. And that's absolutely um, key, isn't it? You know, um, working in collaboration, yes. um, knowing the whole child, the whole body, where, you know, um, the whole um, well, and it's interesting, I think, as well, that um, neurotypical children and children across cultures are going to benefit as much from those, these therapeutic strategies as children with additional needs. I guess yeah. recognising that that all children benefit from that kind of support. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, completely right. You know, it's what works for children, works for all children, mm. you know. That's, um, you know, a philosophy for yeah. life. For and, they, sure. and they will find their level. It's you know, it's like water. You know, we some of the environments that we, we set up are so basic in the sense that when we're outside, we'll have two mats. We'll have a mat for the parents and we'll have the mat for the for the, char the, the kids. But we'll also make sure we've got a cubby space so that, you know, the play can happen there. But the learning and the opportunities for learning are, are really child-led and we are there just to facilitate those things to happen. But it, it's just, I just feel that the natural environment has such, so much to offer. And I suppose we just don't acknowledge it anymore as, as well, I don't say we, that generally, there's a lot of people that really do, but, but I think we underestimate the value of the, the natural environment, mm. I suppose, to actually provide so much for the child and to support their behaviours as well. Have really have problems. There's another one, nice one that's come through around parents and grandparents who are not engaging in play with their child um, mm. in those settings. I guess mm. from a playgroup perspective, part of our job is to help parents and grandparents remember or learn how to play in the first instance. Yeah. So from mm. a programming perspective, that's around creative, creating activities that families can do together. Mm. Um, but when we think back to that environment of security, before that can happen, family need, families need to feel safe and they need to feel embedded in the environment. So I guess, um, first of all, start by making them feel like they're a part of that community and then mm. build on activities that encourage that play with their children. Mm. And I think, you know, if we can just add a little bit to that, our idea that, you know, we, we will run a group where parents may not want to engage at all with their children. And it doesn't come naturally in Aboriginal communities for people to actually sit there and fully engage with their, with their kids because they see play as being kids' business, really. And they are doing their own meaningful um, work, but that's that that model works really well in our in our environment too. So that 
the child knows that the parents there and they're and they're present and um, sometimes that's you know as important as anything and then slowly the interactions start to happen the child will come over and see what the adult's doing and the adult might start to show the child you know this is this is what you can do so it just it becomes natural rather than um, forced yeah yeah mm. the dance of life mm. play mm. Um, mm. and I guess there was a quote, like an Alan Watts quote. It says, the real secret of life to be mm. is to be completely engaged with what you're doing mm. in the here and now. Mm. And instead of calling it work, realize it's play, um, which really, I think yeah. it just, yeah, it brings us back to ourselves as educators, like mm. setting up that space, mm. um, but then taking into account, you know, that mm. connectingness mm. of children and families together. Mm. And um, if we are connected to play ourselves, mm. and, you know, we can we can create that kind of together, that mm. space together. Mm. So I really, yeah, mm. enjoyed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Um, and, yeah, there's, a beautiful question there about yeah the parents and grandparents which I think mm. we, was covered and, yeah yeah I Nicole mentioned that one yeah. yeah but not to put pressure I think that's part of it you know you'd agree with that Nicole I'm sure that not to put pressure on parents who who may have their own issues you know even associated with play or learning you know in our case we have a quite a lot of families that we're working with that have had such a bad experience with formal learning themselves that they feel very uncomfortable and and almost under you know under pressure to perform well and um, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to happen right there and then if you're giving them no. the supports and skills to try at home in that yeah. other 95 percent of the week yeah. uh, they are still really important skills to be sharing yeah definitely absolutely yeah mm -hmm. I'm just gonna <laughs> Anna, Anna's back. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I popped back up, but we still have five minutes. Um, so there's another question that just came through and just um, we probably have time for this one and maybe one more. Mm. Yeah. When I go to the conversation with the parent about their child, the parent responds by saying they will forward what I um, plan to say to the school. Yeah. So the parent doesn't think he needs be involved in the conversation but passes the responsibility around oh, yeah. oh I would alt I would strongly disagree to that sentiment I'm sorry mm. um I would say the parent is likely to be managing a whole range of inputs and is likely to be confused and feeling disempowered about the best thing for your child um the key message we get is I don't from families is I don't know how to do this I don't know how to parent a child who has additional needs um mm. whilst families are certainly the expert in their child in terms of, of understanding and knowing the strategies to support and manage them they often feel they lack those competencies so I would think if anything that's a parent suggesting that they they don't quite know what to do themselves and they trust your technical skill to be passed on to the teachers rather than them losing the, the message somewhere along the way but that that's just my personal bias apology yeah, no, and, it, and, and yeah. I guess that's the beauty of mm. um, our supported play groups mm. and having parents there is, you know, it can be that journey together where it's, um, you know, um, learning and um, confidence building mm. as well. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Mm. Um, and acknowledging that responsibility for these things falls upon everyone. Um, kids spend a really significant time at school. They also spend a significant time at home. So both therapists, educators and, and parents as well are sharing that um, instructional load. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm. Um, also think, this is from Nadia, I also <laughs> think that paves the way for um, successful transitions, um, which, mm. yeah, is um, integral as well to, um, you know, the transitions from um, the play group, from the early childhood setting to the school, mm. and just that, you know, those that confidence built within parents can then be translated into the school setting you know mm. it's not it's it's a whole journey the transition so mm. you know the more we can talk about the value of play as educators you know it, it can be a thing with parents where as educators we can see the richness in play but you know to always talk about that and highlight that as well to bring mm. through um the rich learning in play can then be translated to um parents and families mm. and then into education mm -hmm. no are we are we are, no we've only got a few more minutes um Anna but I'm just 
looking at that question that's just come up from Lan, I think. Um, and she's just, it sounds to me as if she's got parents that are saying, look, can you provide as many sessions as possible, but we're not available to talk about what's going on for the, I'm assuming about the child, or maybe we don't even want to be involved in the, in the therapy, but you know, but, but you need to do all the work. Um, I know, I know, I'm hoping I'm not um, misinterpreting what you mean there, Lan, but I, but I think at times there's a statement that I remember hearing that said that, you know, the child is really just the barometer for the family. So, I, and I'm not sure whether we're talking about a child with a disability, but if we talk about the environment that's created at home or in the play therapy session or the, ses the session, um, the child is reacting, you know, either whether it be to home or to be the, to the session that they're in. And the family is part of that dynamic. So some therapists would say we won't work with the child individually, that they actually, we really need to look at the family as a, as a dynamic. And I'm just interested to hear what, maybe not what you'd have about that, to say about that as well, Nicole, that really it is the, the family do need to be involved because the child well, isn't. Therapists have often told me that they have our children for one or two hours a week mm -hmm. and that one of their key roles is to teach the family how to support their child in those outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly that would be my, my feeling as well, that therapy is a family affair, that therapy time is about providing the overarching capacity building tools so that families can then act on them. Yeah. yeah. Beautifully said. Um, that's probably a beautiful way to end mm. um, with the focus for this week is actually tomorrow's International Day of Families. And um, part of the reason why we put this back on was to talk about the role of families um, in all of the aspects of the work that we're doing. So I think that's a beautiful way to end. Um, thank you so, so much. I've just learned so much. And um, I've been holding a leaf the whole time, playing it with my in my hands. And I think it's a really good reminder that all the things that our little people like, um, big people like too. So thank you for bringing me back to play. Um, and thank you all so much for people who have joined us today. Um, so grateful. And if you haven't already booked in, um, tomorrow is our International Day of Families celebration. And we're having a conversation about um, how we need to change systems and structures to be family centered so that our programs and supports can uh, respond to families adequately. So please come book in. It will be fun. Um, and again, Bethan, Helen and Nicole, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Thanks everyone. And thank you to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.